from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, K-State's Greg Hanselcheck on a typically lesser cause of scours disease in newborn beef calves that's showing up noticeably this year, a strain caused by salmonella. Greg will look at why it's turning up and the importance of sampling it and having it diagnosed. Then from the Kansas Forest Service at K-State, Dennis Carlson will discuss the ongoing wildfire threat in Kansas, why that's such a formidable concern currently. He'll talk about fire behavior when the fuel load is this heavy and the conditions are conducive to wildfires spreading rapidly. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee on new research on the compatibility of coyotes and red foxes in urban settings. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned into the Tuesday edition of Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening. Those newborn beef calves here in the springtime have health challenges often anyway, but our guest now is telling us that there is an uncommon newborn calf condition that is showing up in samples sent to the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. The director of that lab's Production Animal Field Investigations Unit, K-State veterinarian Greg Hanselcheck is back with us, and this is a, what you're describing, Greg, as an emerging neonatal health challenge for newborn beef calves. It's similar to something that many a cow-calf producer encounters and has to contend with at calving time, but different by the same token. Fill us in on what's going on here, if you would. Well, again, we talk to producers on this program and other places about neonatal scours every year. And we always list the organisms that are associated with it. So we say, you know, it's E. coli, rota, corona, crypto. And then we say, yeah, and then salmonella. But what we're seeing in the laboratory over the last couple of weeks, two to three weeks, are excessive or more than normal number of salmonella-associated neonatal diarrhea scour outbreaks in our cow-calf herds. Kansas, Nebraska, many other states that we, that we work with. So it, emerging disease... We've talked about it, but kind of on the second shelf. But there's something different this year because we are seeing more salmonella-associated diarrhea in in beef calves. In other words, we talk about it in passing, but it's so rare. It very infrequently comes up, but it has this year. So what are the symptoms of this kind of scours? Well, the the thing about salmonella is that there's 2,200 and some different types. There's three major ones in the bovine, and it really depends on what type of salmonella is on the operation. But the ones we're we're looking at today are, they present as calves uh, suddenly go through 10 days of age and older. They're somewhat aged calves, and they suddenly break out in a diarrhea that has contains blood. And it's we're not talking about you can look at the stool and see blood clots. We're talking about a a stool that has that brownish look where the blood's incorporated. And then just like any other scours, these calves become very dehydrated and uh, depressed. Most of these cases, the veterinarians say if if they're administered electrolytes and an antibiotic, that these calves respond very, very well, which is not always true with the other salmonellas, but uh, apparently this one's pretty treatable. But you have to know it's there and have an idea of what you're working with here because scours can be triggered by so many other things. Absolutely. At 10 days of age up to 30 days, it could be any of the things we talked about ex- except for maybe E. coli. So the first thing that we always recommend is if there's a br- outbreak is let's take some samples and try to figure out what the predominant organism is. Mm-hmm. If it's salmonella, we may treat, we're going to treat it the same, but there's different prevention methods that we would use compared to some of the other diseases that other organisms that we'd find. 
Well, because it, as you say, is more prominent than we normally see, this salmonella prompted scours, what is the origin of the salmonella? Where is it coming from? Well, that's a great question, and that's one we always always receive. And at least for one of these types of uh, salmonella, cattle are what are called host adapted, so they can become carriers and they can be asymptomatic. So we know there's carrier animals in the herd. We know that birds can carry salmonella. Rodents, raccoons, dogs, cats. Uh, they even there's even people that associate flies can move the salmonella from operation to operation. So there's lots of different possibilities of what the source is on any you know, on any organization. In fact, you noted before we went on the air that it can even survive on equipment. Absolutely, it, one of the things that it's been proven many times a balling gun or a one of the, the tubers or the esophageal feeders we use for neonatal calves, it can live on that plastic and that metal for long enough time to spread it from animal to animal if we're not cleaning those instruments and disinfecting them between use. And you added that some calves may actually be born with this salmonella? There's some recent work to show that this uh, organism can pass through the placenta to the calf it can cause abortions and other things, but if the calf survives, there's a certain percentage of these calves will already be have salmonella and be carriers at birth. If you would, Greg, then elaborate on the treatment protocol here, and you got at some of the basic responses to this kind of salmonella once it's diagnosed. Well, it's like any scours. The calf's going to die from dehydration, so it's, it's uh, fluids, and hopefully it's oral fluids, oral fluids, oral fluids. Hopefully we're not we're not to the point where we have to do sub Q uh, IVs, but for salmonella, at least in these cases, uh, the response to antibiotics seems to be very positive. So choosing the correct antibiotic in addition to the the electrolytes is probably probably wise. But you'd treat it somewhat similarly to other scours types, you say? Absolutely. The other types of scours, I mean, it's controversial whether we should use an antibiotic or not. Okay. Uh, at least from what we're seeing in these cases, that that may be that may be appropriate. And again, it's controversial. I I would recommend that producers use their veterinarians' advice on exactly what the entire treatment protocol should be. Well, what about the preventative side? Is there a vaccine regimen that'll work against this salmonella-induced scours? There's uh, that's the one good thing about this. There are several really effective in the field vaccine, salmonella, and then it's called salmonella SRPs. And those vaccines have been shown to be very, very effective in preventing the neonatal diarrhea, you know, before the season starts. And most of these vaccines are labeled to vaccinate the cow or the heifer prior to calving so that she passes the antibodies into the colostrum for the calf. So that goes back to the importance of consuming the colostrum also. But that would be for future reference because you say before you'd commit to a vaccine protocol of this type, you need to know that that's the organism at hand. Absolutely. There wouldn't be any reason for an operation if uh, salmonella was not involved or the predominant organism involved for them to add a SRP vaccine. They're not expensive, but they're not inexpensive either. And it's just, it wouldn't make sense. So again, at least for us in the diagnostic lab, we we really believe that doing some diagnostics to figure out what exactly that organism is very, very important. And you can channel that through your local veterinarian. That's where you start with samples to the veterinary diagnostic laboratory. Absolutely. Call the veterinarian and they can guide the, the owner on exactly how to take the samples. A lot of times on these neonatal scour diarrhea things, just taking a several handfuls on the ground. We don't have to actually get the animal in and, and do swabs or anything. We can take some what we call pen grabs of the feces and then send it into the laboratory for diagnosis. That leads to one added caution about this kind of scours condition, and this is a zoonotic pathogen, so there's a human health factor in here too. Well, and that's that's the other reason why at least some of us believe that in a scour outbreak, we need to find out what it is because two of those organisms, crypto and especially salmonella, they can infect humans. It's a very dangerous disease, especially in uh, in kids or older humans, and it can become a lifelong uh, gastrointestinal issue. So if we know we have salmonella, we can take uh, extraordinary precautions for sanitation. 
wear gloves, don't care, put our coveralls in the in the house, uh, make sure our kids and, and the older people aren't around these calves. But again, we need to find out whether it's what, what organism we're actually dealing with. And to that end, once again, you and your staff are interested in tracking down why you've seen this particular disease problem pop in this calving season. So if producers are are curious about this, think it might be happening on their place, talk to their veterinarian, and you'd welcome any kind of information along that line from the field. Absolutely. I've been here for 10 years now, and any time any calls about uh, neonatal scours, like I said, I would mention salmonella in passing, but I don't know if this is just a weird year or uh, what's the stress of the cold brought on the the clinical signs or what it is, but I think salmonella needs to be talked about not just in passing, but it should be talked like with other pathogens. Well, all the best to you and your team in tracking down what's going on there. And this heads up is very much appreciated as we've yet quite a bit of calving to go here in the spring season here in Kansas. Greg, as always, thanks for coming over. Appreciate it. He's the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit with the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. That's Greg Hanselcheck. You can contact that laboratory very easily through the information provided on their website, ksvdl.org. That's ksvdl.org. Right there on that front page, you'll find tabs taking you to the full information on tests and fees, on how to see test results by logging in, submission forms, how to submit samples, and on top of that, quite an assortment of how-to videos. Helpful to practitioner and producer. So, as you would see it beneficial, take full advantage of the laboratory and its services. ksvdl.org When we come back on agriculture today after this break, the spotlight is on our ongoing wildfire concerns in Kansas. This is the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and we'll take up now a topic that is escalating in Kansas. We hope that we can see this minimized as rainfall is provided, but the wildfire season in the state is off and roaring, unfortunately. And we want to talk more about what is instigating that wildfire threat this year. We brought on board now from the Kansas Forest Service here at Kansas State University an assistant fire management officer. He's based in South Central Kansas, is Dennis Carlson. Dennis, thanks for joining us. And we have a whale of a lot of volatile fuel out there right now. But let's start with that and the nature of that fuel that hikes, frankly, this wildfire threat. Yeah, um, kind of what we've been seeing is we kind of have to start looking back in the 2020 and what has been going on. Um, so if we go all the way back into January of 2020 and looking across the state, um, you know, we start looking at the drought monitor and seeing what's happening with the fuels out there. And when we look at that drought monitor, at the start of 2020, actually, we're pretty good in the entire state, except for some counties way in southwest Kansas, also up in the northwest part of the state. Uh, we did get some good rains going in from April, May. But then we all know what happened after that May time frame. The rains had, had stopped and the entire state started going, turning more into a drought trend. Now, certainly, we received a little bit of snows over this winter, the moisture in the main areas of the state. Um, but a lot of that snow did not have moisture in it. So as we start looking at, you know, what's happening here in Kansas, so we had fairly good grass growth going through 2020. And then we went into a drought situation. And this year, we are much further into a drought situation. If you were to take a, draw a line from Kansas City down to liberal Kansas, anything north of that is trending significantly toward drought situations, especially if you get along the Colorado border. Those are extreme drought and up even in northwest Kansas. So 
when you start looking at drought, part of what that means is green up will take much longer in those areas. And of course, green up is one of those things we look forward to because it helps uh, slow those wildfires out and, and lessens the intensity. So, you know, if we were to look at the the grass component, kind of more in that central southeast area, uh, like I said, we had some really good growth. Um, so our fuels are loaded up really well. And when, like I talked about fuels, fuels are grasses and, mm -hmm. and brush and trees and those type of things. So so we're seeing a, a heavy grass component out there. Now, of course, fire behavior, we look at that as a triangle. Um, so you got your fuels, your topography, and your weather. And so, you know, once we enter this time of the year, uh, we do have to be careful on what we're doing out there on the landscape. When we talk about the anatomy of that fuel load, as a fire gets started and when you have this dry of fuel out there, the heat builds upon itself and these things physically accelerate at sometimes remarkable rates, even if the winds aren't howling, don't they? Yeah, that's true, especially when you start looking at the fire and the humidity levels. Uh, as you go further down in humidity, your fire intensity will significantly increase. And as fire intensity significantly increases, now one thing a fire needs is oxygen. It starts pulling oxygen, and that accelerates the movement of that fire. Even under it may not be an incredibly windy day, that fire can start to basically produce on its, quote, own wind and, and move rapidly. So, you know, we see quite a bit of that, especially you know, on some of these lower wind days. Um, I know when we do prescribe fires, we prefer never to do it under a light and variable wind because that fire will create its own wind and move directions you're not expecting it. But yeah, with our humidities, and it was amazing, I was watching, looking at the humidities uh, yesterday, and it was amazing to see humidity levels around 18 percent in northeast Kansas, which is incredibly low. And when you see a humidity getting below 30 percent, your fire activity significantly increases below 20 percent. It did almost doubles. It is just incredibly much more intense as you get lower humidities. And with that, I was just kind of laughing to myself because you saw that 18% in Topeka area up in that northeast Kansas, and it was 40% in southwest, <laughs> which is very uncommon. It's um, just the opposite of the norm. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. But humidity is the, is the big driver, and of course your winds and your, and your fuel loading in the intensity of your fire behavior. You and your colleagues with Kansas Forest Service do track fire outbreaks and incidents, of course, uh, regularly at this time of the year and, and all year for that matter. We have seen more already than we would at the early part of March. Is that so? I would say what we saw, even going back into uh, last October, November, and December, we saw several large wildfires, which, you know, typically, you know, we'd say tongue-in-cheek in Kansas, it's usually spring we see wildfires, but, you know, we saw quite a few in the fall, and I think our, our local fire departments were a little bit more busy in the fall, and certainly oh, this last week they have been very busy also. This is even before the prescribed burning season really gets started as the calendar goes. That varies some each year, but the bulk of that activity is yet to come, right? Yeah, that's correct. Usually the main, I would call it the dormant season burns, uh, is that late March, April time frame. You know, especially in the Flint Hills of Kansas, um, you start seeing a lot of prescribed fire activity in those areas. As you interact then with producers who are routinely conducting controlled burns, prescribed fire, as an important management tool for our grasslands in particular in Kansas. What messages do you try to pass along to those folks right now? Yeah, usually when, when you look at prescribed fire, one of the big messages is, is number one, have to have a primary goal of why you're burning. And like you said a little bit earlier, that could be brush management. It could be weight gains and those type of things. And it's always good to have that primary goal, of what, you, what you want to accomplish with that burn. Now, the other things you start looking at, uh, especially prescribed burning, is, you know, start looking at that land uh, that you are preparing to burn. Make sure it is prepared. You know, are you, do you have proper fire breaks? Are you going to be burning off of, you know, a natural break, which may be, a stream, a river, a uh, rock, a rock outcropping. Sometimes you see that, but roads, those type of things. But are those areas prepared to burn, to properly hold that prescribed fire you're going to put on the ground? 
and the other thing I you know always talk about is make sure you kind of ha- you have in place a plan and know what how you'd like to have have that burn done. Make sure you have enough manpower, equipment, resources. Also, you know, getting that burn permit from that local county and knowing your county rules and calling those in helps out greatly. The other thing that I'd like to talk to them about is, number one, you know, we look at the weather, which weather is key, you know, the humidities and wind speeds. The sites I like to really prefer to look at is, the, is on the National Weather Service and look at their hourly weather forecast um, because that tells you not only what the humidity is going to do, where it is at currently, but what it's going to do later on in the afternoon, what the winds are going to do, what direction the winds are going to come from. And part of that also is what is tomorrow's weather. It's too often, I think, you know, we say, oh, it's a great burn day, but we really need to look at tomorrow. Because that wind all of a sudden could shift. Say you, if you're burning on a day, it's you know a nice southwest wind, 10 miles an hour. You know your humidity's above 30. You know it's a nice burn day. You look at tomorrow, and you got a 40 mile an hour northwest wind and low humidity. Then you're going to have to start asking yourself: Will my burn stay where it is? Um, do I need to do extra mop up? Do I need to do extra due diligence around the edges of those fire? You know, putting out cow pies, making sure there's no burning trees close to the edges, uh, making sure there's no brush piles or anything that's smoldering or still could produce embers that next day that could that could kick out, and then it will become a wildfire. And then our volunteers and other fire service have to to deal with those. And that's not to even mention the incidental ignitions of a fire, the uh, muffler on an ATV, for instance, those kinds of things that are inadvertent but yet lead to the same issue. Yep, and and the other one that that we see quite a bit of uh, in a lot of areas is wheel bearings, wheel bearings on trailers, uh, semis, um, and even tow chains, uh, dragging chains. You know, a lot of people going along the road on these, um, you know, along the highway popping sparks. Anytime those, you know, once they hit the ditch where that's where those fuels are ready, you know, and the humidity is right, the humidity is low, then those fuels can be receptive and you can be dealing with a wildfire. The point there is that caution is Uh, should be a watchword for everybody involved in any kind of activity near these areas which are loaded up with fuels. And uh, a good, well-dispersed rainfall event (laughs) would help. It won't cure the threat, but it it would help. In the absence of that, people need to be aware. Yeah, and that's correct. And and rain, even though you could have a nice rainfall one day, you get a good dry south Kansas wind the next day, You know, it only takes, you know, an hour for those grasses to dry out once that humidity gets low enough, and then that is receptive fuel again. Once more, we hope folks will take their due diligence in keeping wildfires from occurring in the state of Kansas as we forge our way through the remainder of this spring and into summertime, and as Dennis described, with that enormous and combustible fuel load out there, to say the least, across the fair part of Kansas. Dennis, we appreciate the input. Thanks for joining us right here. Thank you. Dennis Carlson is an assistant fire management officer with the Kansas Forest Service out of Kansas State University. And we'll be back with more for you in a few moments. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care positions, especially in rural areas, Health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy and part of DTN. Starting with the weekly crop progress and condition report posted by the USDA for the week ending this past Sunday. Our topsoil moisture supplies were rated at 4% surplus and 49% adequate, but 47% short to very short. Subsoil moisture, roughly the same, 1% surplus, 51% adequate, and 48% short to very short. The condition of the winter wheat crop this week was called 36% good to excellent, 37% fair, 
and 27 percent poor to very poor. U.S. agricultural exports totaled $15.5 billion in the month of January, according to the USDA, down slightly from the monthly record of $15.9 billion registered back in December. It still marked the fourth straight month of U.S. agricultural exports topping $15 billion. That's something that has not been seen based on data going back to the 1970s. Agricultural imports rising to $12.8 billion, that's a new record, up from $11.6 billion in December. That left a trade surplus then of $2.6 billion for January. So far in fiscal year 21, U.S. agricultural exports totaling $62 billion against imports of $47.5 billion. That's a surplus so far of $14.5 billion. The USDA is currently forecasting fiscal 21 ag exports at $157 billion, imports at $137.5 billion. That would leave a trade surplus of $19.5 billion billion dollars. Now, the situation with agricultural exports clearly reflects China's stepped-up purchases and shipments of U.S. agricultural goods and has translated into U.S. agricultural exports above $15 billion for, again, four straight months. The USDA's Gary Crawford has more on that angle. As if there were doubts about this, the trade numbers for the first four months of the 2021 fiscal year definitely show it. China is now our number one buyer of soybeans, corn, wheat, and cotton. USDA economist Bart Kenner, he says Chinese purchases of U.S. ag products overall are up. 187% from $6.4 billion in fiscal year 20 to $18.3 billion in fiscal year 21. Kenner says during the first four months of this fiscal year, soybeans are up 222% from $3.9 billion to $12.5 billion. Corn is up 332,343% from 288 million to 957 million. Cotton sales to China up 307%. The only major product showing a decline is pork. Chinese purchases running 27% below a year ago. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt along with 11 other state attorneys general, filed a lawsuit yesterday seeking to block the Biden administration's attempt to implement parts of the so-called Green New Deal by executive order. The lawsuit challenges the president's executive order 13990, which would impose binding rules that federal agencies must use to calculate the social costs of greenhouse gases when creating federal regulations. The suit alleges the administration has no statutory authority to decree the formula to be used for calculating those costs. The attorney general argues the potential stringency of federal regulations imposed at the direction of this order would harm agriculture, stifle manufacturing, and cause serious damage to Kansas and the country. Now it's on to this week's edition of Milk Lines. Here's K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today, I want to talk to our Kansas dairy producers concerning the value of a pregnancy within your dairy herd. As we look at how we improve efficiencies on our dairies, one of the things I really do think we need to take a hard look at is the value of pregnancies within the herd. Really, this goes beyond the discussion about beef on dairy and Uh, what exactly that calf is that the cow might be carrying. This is just straight up, what is the cost of obtaining a, a pregnancy on your dairy? And as we look at that, there's many different things that we probably ought to consider in calculating that. So on an annual basis, we probably need to understand what is our cost for semen, What is our cost for uh, the sink programs that we might be using or other heat detection uh, software or equipment that we might use? What is the cost of actually doing insemination on our farms? The veterinary work that might go with checking for pregnancy and those sorts of things. If you're using any sort of uh, in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer, or anything like that, that's part of it as well. And uh, another thing to consider is what is the cost of keeping the records? And then as you start to look at this, not every pregnancy goes full term on your dairy. You have a lot of aborts, so you need to figure out what the cost of abortion is on your dairy, and that's actually probably quite a sizable cost in actuality. Now, usually when we're doing this, we don't include 
the uh, lost revenue from milk that might be associated with abortions. It's just the actual cost of that as it occurs in our herd. The interesting thing is, as we look at abortions, particularly if we're looking at situations where we're detecting pregnancy very early, between 28 and, say, 32 or 34 days of pregnancy, we do have a significant early embryonic loss issue in, in most of our dairies. This is due to a lot of different things. Could be stress, could be uh, things to do with our feeding program. Uh, there's lots of different things that figure into that. But if you actually look at that on your dairy, you're probably looking at somewhere between maybe 15 and 18 percent of the pregnancies are not carried full term for various reasons. So this is a very significant cost to us. So as you figure that, uh, you come up with the value of a pregnancy in your herd. I think you'll find that it's actually uh, quite a bit more than what you expected it to be. So how do you improve on this? As we look at improving what we do uh, within our herd in terms of reproductive efficiency, the 21-day pregnancy rate is an important thing to consider. So this is something that I I want you to think about. If you're currently sitting at a 15% preg rate and you can move your preg rate to 20% within your herd, that will probably increase your savings about $50 a cow a year. If you're sitting at 30%, which would be a fairly excellent pregnancy rate, but we have herds that are uh, as much as 35% on pregnancy rate, that would be moving your herd about $21 per cow per year. So if you have a lower pregnancy rate, uh, that's a steeper part of the scale that I'm looking at. So your improvement there will pay you more per cow than if you're sitting at that upper level of the curve. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension encouraging our dairy farmers to consider what pregnancy is worth on their farm and how they can improve on that return on their investment. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, a visit with Charlie Lee, former wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. He's along with us every Tuesday. In hand, Charlie, yet another study just out, and this looked at the, to put it this way, coexistence of coyotes and red foxes in urban landscapes. And these two canine species are found increasingly, we're told, in urban settings. Yes, we know that coyotes are now expanding their range into areas where they historically were not apparent. We're not exactly sure when red fox started colonizing in urban areas, but suggest probably in the late 50s, early 1960s, where red fox were starting to move in and do well in some of the more urban areas. Realize that there's about 88 percent of Americans live in urban environments, and the urban Land acreage has quadrupled since 1945. That trend is likely to continue as more than 5 billion people are predicted to live in urban areas by 2030. That's just nine short years down the road that 5 billion people are going to be living in these urban areas. And that urbanization affects biodiversity, the predator and prey composition out there, including species like coyotes and red fox and coyotes and skunks and some of the avian predator species as well. Uh, We know that coyotes and red fox are often competitors that use similar type resources and that they can have some top-down impacts on prey communities. In rural areas, red fox and coyotes often exist in the same area but at different times. Uh, When they're in those areas at the same time, they can have competition where coyotes and red fox display territoriality as a mechanism that regulates their populations. But typically, coyotes are the apex carnivores in most urban areas. It's doubtful that we're ever going to come back with lions and tigers (laughs) uh, in those type of, of areas. So coyotes are probably going to be the top predator. And there are a lot of people in those urban areas that don't see anything wrong with having predators like coyotes in those areas. 
many people are willing to accept that there may be some problems with predators, uh, whether they're from coyotes or other animals like raccoons or fox or skunks. In urban areas, they may have some problems in their landscapes or gardening efforts. Occasionally, some pets may be consumed by predators, but they accept that because of their desire to see and be associated with wildlife. But the interest here is to gauge that competition between red fox and coyotes in the urban areas. Yes, a study was published in 2018 at the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, looking at coyotes and red fox. And in that particular case, the researchers uh, did not find that competition between coyotes and red fox that many people have observed in other research reports in rural areas. In one case, they witnessed and had images of coyotes visiting a fox den. Perhaps that was because the foxes were bringing dead rabbits or other food for their kits, and hungry coyotes were taking advantage of that easy meal. But they knew there were at least four other fox dens in that territory that they could have easily moved those young kits to, and they never, ever moved them. And that's even when coyotes were showing up at the mouth of that den about every other day. During the time of that research trial, which was from January 15 to December of 2016, they never found a single aggressive encounter between coyotes and red fox. They're not sure what to make of that particular behavior, but their initial hypothesis was was the availability of food. Herbivore species like Rabbits, deer, and mice have a bounty of food options. So those plants are often replaced in garden situations by humans. In addition, humans have compost piles, garbage cans, pet food that's being fed outside. There's a lot of food options in urban areas for animals that have a general diet or omnivorous diet. So instead of coyotes and foxes fighting for resources... They coexist seemingly more peacefully due to this human-created abundance of food. That's not just the study that was done at the University of Wisconsin. There's been similar type studies that it's done. Uh, One example was done at Columbus, Ohio, looking at the predator-prey relationship between nest birds and raccoons, opossums, and crows, which would be common predators. They found that the nest survival decreased in rural landscapes when they had more predators present, but the same effect didn't hold true in urban environments. Another long-term study done on coyotes in urban area is focused around Chicago. In that particular area, urban coyotes are somewhat unusual in that they seem to be reluctant to eat human food, even when it's readily available. Hmm. They kind of stick to their traditional diet of small mammals and bird eggs, and they still act as predators with a controlling effect on some of the population of prey species like Canada geese or even white-tailed deer. We know that competition between coyotes and other predators might be less in an urban environment than what we had expected and certainly less than what we see in rural areas. Perhaps that's due to the lack of larger predators. But it's also important to realize that it may be uh, due to the abundance of food resources that's found in urban areas compared to what's available in the rural landscapes. This predator compatibility, though, it could change over time as more predators load up those urban areas and urban areas themselves tend to sprawl? Well, as long as there's green space in those urban areas, we'll probably be creating habitat for those predator species that are like coyotes and fox that are pure generalists. So I expect the populations to increase. But at the same time, as those areas expand, probably the food resources are going to increase. So I'm not sure that there will be something different happening in the future as those cities expand in area. Well, it really is an interesting dynamic as these predatory species start to roam similar territory and that they tend to, to put it this way, get along, as this research has depicted. Charlie, thanks for going over this with us right here. He's a former wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee there. 
And our time is away once again. Thanks for being along with us here today, and please rejoin us right here again tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson here, bidding you a good day for agriculture today. This is the K-State Radio Network.